Okay, uh, we've got plenty of time for more questions. We're going to move on to a, a brief interactive panel discussion. Uh, Simon's going to dive in. He's got some questions lined up. So uh, if Arthur's around, here he is. Um, we didn't get the stalls. You're going to have to stand. It's a standing panel. We don't see that often. That's fine. It's a coin scrum first. We like to set trends here. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to Simon. And as I said, want this to be interactive as well. So uh, we'll kind of iterate between uh, the guys up on stage and you in the audience as well. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so everyone having fun so far? <laughs> Informative? No? Yes. Uh, so yeah, as we've uh, seen, it's a little bit more complicated than just private and public. Uh, blockchains, no, these are distributed ledgers, of course. Uh, finality, these are more important points, okay? Uh, so with that, we'll ask more questions and actually figure out a bit more mm. of how these two different uh, platforms operate. Mm. <clears throat> so to start off, uh, what are the type of stakeholders that you, your platforms tend to attract? Oh, that's a good question. What stakeholders does it attract? Um, I guess it's mainly, it, it took, it took me a while to realize this, but it, it was, it was, it, all the, not all, that's, that's, that's probably, that's an exaggeration. Many of the, the biggest or most advanced projects or things that we have that are live kind of have this same pattern where there's a, there's a, there's, there's an existing market, people are already transacting, but because of the decentralization of that market, the market itself hasn't yet been optimized by IT in a way the individual firms have. So the stakeholders are typically people who worry about market structure or people who worry about the operation of the market in which they compete. They have, they have this, they're in this kind of strange hybrid role where they're all fierce competitors, but they also have a shared interest in the market working more efficiently. So they've got this, there's, there's a tension, but there's the, there's the reason for them to come together to try and improve the, you know, improve the operation of that market together. And they find certainly the quarter message, but maybe business blockchains in general, they find it quite attractive because they see it as a way to sort of like make this change they've been waiting for. It's something we see in all these different places. Very good. Uh, Arthur? <clears throat> better? Nope. Oh, yep, yeah. Good. There we go. Uh, it's very uh, heterogeneous. So, you know, you have uh, a, a, a bit of everything. Uh, some of people are uh, developers trying to build tooling applications. Uh, there are people doing applications in real, like there are like uh, large players doing applications in real estate, very uh, smaller players trying to do things with uh, uh, mobility and, uh, and and cars. So it's, it's uh, some other players in insurance. So, uh, you know, actors of all sizes, I was mentioning this in my answer about, you know, uh, Coinbase doing custody. And so, you know, you have um, very, very uh, small validators on the Tezos network, like people who are basically making a, uh, a block a day maybe and, uh, and, all, uh, and, and lodgers. And uh, I, I would say for stakeholders, it's the same thing. It's really varied in terms of industry and size. Thank you. And I'm glad you brought up uh, custody because uh, the next question is about business models. And uh, so how do your uh, platforms differentiate in business models? Uh, so it's, it's not a business, so there's no uh, business model in the same way that the internet doesn't have a business model. Uh, it's an open source project. Uh, a lot of the funding comes from nonprofits, and the point of, uh, the point of it is to be uh, a platform that people can, uh, can use and, uh, and build useful things with or, uh, uh, or benefit from. So I guess we're a bit different because, you know, I'm, I'm unashamed about the fact that R3 is a business. So you've got, and so you've got this, we have this like interesting situation where we're trying to, we're trying to balance the interests of, of multiple, to use this word again, multiple different stakeholders. So clearly the people who take the risk to build the applications, so that previous example, you know, Finastra, that is a commercial firm that has seen an opportunity to improve how syndicated lending makes. You know, there has to be a way for them to succeed and make money if this thing happens, whether it's transaction fees or whatever their business model is. You know, it's got to be completely upfront about that. If someone's going to take a risk, if someone's going to invest in pulling together a group of firms to do something, there needs to be a way for them to benefit from it. So one, you know, that has to be possible, but it also means that the platform provider, so the Corda open source community, and R3, and I'll come on to our role in a minute, you know, we have to make sure we leave space for that and we're not this sort of like, we don't, we don't even attempt to be this sort of like rapacious firm who cap captures all the value. As a platform provider, you have to be intensely relaxed about everybody else capturing most of the value and you get a small slice. But if the software is open source, how do we make any money? And, and again, we've been pretty open about this. We've been completely open about this, which is the base platform quarter is open source. The, this, this, you know, this, the specification, if you like, is something that you can download and you can deploy. 
what we offer, and this is a really just like really traditional, almost boring business model, is we offer a commercial distribution on top. There are some extra features and there's support, support the stuff you, you, you get from an open core model, if that's what you want to call it. You can choose, as people do, to buy the commercial version. The key points being the commercial version, and this is the only reason this model can work, the, the commercial version is completely interoperable with and compatible with the open source model, open source version, creating the right incentive, which is if we, if we mess up, we put the prices up too high, we don't innovate fast enough, people who are using the commercial version can just switch back to the free one. So there's the right sort of balance of incentives between us and the community and us and the people building the apps. Um, but we think it's important just to be completely transparent about that. There's, there's no magic here. You know, we're a commercial firm and that, that's how we plan to make money. Can I just, uh, sorry, I'm just going to jump in with that question. I've actually often thought this. I can't remember whether it was you or High Pledger that kind of uh, first had that conversation with your consortium members. Um, I think it was you guys, and you'd already rounded up however many banks, and then someone sat in the room and said, right, we're going to open source everything that you paid for. What, what was the response, and, and how, did you, how, did, how, did, like, you know, how did you convince them that was the right way to go? Yeah, so I... I, I I don't know if there was just one meeting, but I certainly remember being at the steering committee when it was um, you know, when we were discussing it one of the times. And I guess the first thing to point out is, and you're right to you're right to point this out, is you know R three famously began as a consortium. You know we were, if you like, a, you know, a member driven organization where the consortium members you know paid us for our work. You know, we have transitioned. We're now a software company. So there's so there's been there's been that switch. And what the consortium did, Corda was just one of the many things. We didn't stop planning to build Corda. You know, as I went through in that ar ar that argument earlier, it was when we discovered we had to that we somewhat reluctantly began on the path to do it. So um, so it was one of many things that we'd been doing in those in those early years. So um, you know, when, when I tell the story, I probably over dramatize it and make it sound like some sort of big, oh my God, you're gonna do what? When in reality, you know, you just put you, you lay out the logic and you say, you know, this thing will be more successful. This thing that you the banks, because they they helped fund it, this thing that you helped design and which you're going to adopt, um, it will be so much more useful to you. There'll be so many more apps, so many more developers, so many more members of the community, it will deliver more value to you. Um, not through the, the money they're gonna get from licensing, but from the value it gets they get from deploying it in their business it'd be more valuable to you the more people who use this and contribute to it it was just obvious it had to be open i don't want to completely monopolize the uh discussion anybody have any other questions do you, um you see yourselves or each other as competitors or do you see that you could even complement one another Compliment, I think. I, I was, um, I, I, I did a bit of, cause I, I was following you know, the Tezos story in the early days. I remember reading the um, you know, L.M. Goodman's um, paper years and years ago. I remember a conversation we had when I just started at R3. I'd never even heard of OCaml. So I'd been, um, I'd been, I'd been following the, the journey um, with some interest and of course the travails of, of a year or two ago. Uh, but it was only the last few days when I was looking at some of the conclusions you'd reached. And unless I'm maybe putting words into your mouth, but it, it seems that you've reached a similar, conclu similar conclusion to us, which is you know, one of the few... Uh, I guess credible production ready BFT BFT implementations or soon to be production ready is, is Tendermint and many of the others aren't. Right. Now I, I don't know whether you've reached that conclusion or not, but bring uh, words words into your But I think there's some things that we may or may disagree with each other on. But but that seems to be something I was seeing coming out of your community because it's something we've been looking at as well. So. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. so just just to clarify the thing on Tendermint, I uh, <clears throat> I, I like I like different consensus algorithms for uh, uh, for blockchains. I like the one we have. Uh, there's some benefits to Tendermint. I think it's neat. Uh, I, I wouldn't use it in the same way that it's being used in uh, in Cosmos, where you limited in number of validators. I, I think, but basically, uh, I would say like anywhere you might be tempted to use PBFT using Tendermint instead is probably a good idea because it's a simpler uh, uh, iteration on the ID. But um, there are many other ways to uh, to the consensus. So I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's the, I don't think the Tendermint is the end be all. I also like what Avalanche is doing, and you know one of the particularly of Tezos is that you can move, uh, you, you know, you can improve your uh, you can improve your consensus algorithms. Although one of the things that I did like about Tendermint and the Cosmos project is that you know they came in at a time and they made they made consensus boring again, and that was a good that was a good thing because I, I think people were overly focused on consensus, and you still see it today. There's like five or like four or five projects which are coming out and they're basically consensus projects like they only claim to like relevance is say ah we're going to do consensus differently uh in a world where which is open source and in a world which is uh 
you know, where, where, where these ideas can be replicated. I don't think it's uh, it's a big differentiator to just have like a consensus algorithm. So to your question about uh, being competitors, uh, if I understand correctly, and again, maybe I'm uh, I'm wrong about R3, but I, I don't think R3 uh, focuses on consensus. It's focused on uh, representing uh, UTXOs, essentially, like representing assets, representing contracts and transactions. And so in principle, you know, if you wanted to use Corda on top of Tezos, it's something you could, uh, that's something you could realistically do uh, with some plumbing probably, but it's not, uh, it's not impossible. So I don't see it. Uh, I, I don't see it directly as uh, as com uh, as competition. Uh, you know, as uh, you know, if if you're a business using Corda, for example, you can pick your uh, your platform for. Uh, uh, for deploying it now, I do like what we're doing with. Uh, personally, I do like what we're doing with Mikkelsen and uh, and the formal verification of contract. And I would recommend that over Kotlin, but you know that's you're going into uh, like more tastes and uh, and details. Can can I just jump in and follow up on that? Because I think you know again part part of the reason I guess for uh, of of looking these two ideas side by side is um, you know it's often people often go back and say you know talk about you know, private distributed ledgers, blockchain, whatever we're going to call them. Uh, it's just like, you know, early days of the internet, nice walled gardens, AOL or intranets, extranets. Eventually the walls crumbled, everyone got comfortable and they kind of melded into one. Um, I think, you know, one of the obvious examples that people are experimenting with, whether there's real value, I don't know. I'd like to know your thoughts is, um, you know, maybe financial institutions aren't ready to put, you know, high value transactions on public blockchains or trust public smart contracts on a blockchain. Um, but, you know, there's use cases for just anchoring information into the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so that's kind of the first kind of interaction. I mean, does, is that something that R3 the, the, like even considers at this stage that might be a beneficial use case going forward? It's, it's, a re it's really funny you mentioned, man, mentioned anchoring. Um, there's a guy many of you may know, um, John Walpert, who I knew well when I was at IBM. He helped found Hyperledger. He's, he's now with Consensus. And, and this is, we had a, um, you know, we had a sort of like running debate via our blogs earlier this year. And, that, and we did a, then did, a, did a podcast a few months ago. And, and one of the things I was, cause I, I mean, maybe this is just a blind spot I have, but I was, one of the things I was trying to get my head around was this, this notion of anchoring. Because the, the story as it goes is, you know, the, the story often is public blockchains are more secure for all, for all the reasons um, people claim, and therefore you you could or you should you know anchor stuff from a private blockchain into it. But what I could never get an answer to from anyone, and there's probably people in this room who can explain it to me, is okay. Well, fine, but given that you've always got the non-zero probability of a block reorganization, what happens? What happens even when the anchor is washed away? You know, what are you supposed to do at that point? So it's one of these things that um, sounded good, but when you actually sort of drilled into it, you think, well, actually, it's good until it's not, and then I don't actually know what I do. So, um, so, so, so that's not to dismiss the idea of our two, our two communities working together because we spend so much time with each other. But that specific example, I could never. I could never nail it to something that was actually something, something you could engineer against. It always seems to dissolve as you got close to it. Is there an example that you can think of where there is an interaction in the future? Um, so the the challenge or the proposal I gave to to John was because he said you know why can't you but maybe this is the point that Arthur's making as well which is you know you know, um, you know why can't Corda somehow interact on these other platforms and and, and the challenge because I dearly love this was you, know, you can get me a you know, permissionless um, consensus layer so something that can give me that ordering of transactions that guarantees finality um, and I can be convinced you know it doesn't doesn't descend to sort of like you know collusion from six miners give me one of those I'll use it any day of the week you know, that, I don't, you know, I don't need or want to have to build one of those things. I just need something that will give me transaction ordering in a way that people can't collude with, and which I can be sure, uh, I, which, which I can be sure about with finality. You know, if you've got one of those, you know, I'm a buyer of that. And Arthur, I mean, what about you? I mean, from the other yeah. side of the fence, I, I, I think the finality thing is honestly uh, is a bit overblown. And the thing is, is like you, you know, if. You, you don't. You're not going to have any system that's safe against collusion. You know, whether it's a private blockchain or a public blockchain. You know, if people want to go into computers and put in the wrong numbers, people are going to go into computers and put in the wrong numbers, right? So you're always at the mercy of this. And at the end of the day, you should have a system that's kind of like resilient for that possibility. You want to minimize that possibility, but you also want to uh, realize that sometimes, you know, if the system completely uh, uh, goes berserk, then you will have many to uh, to deal with it manually. Uh, and now keep, keep bearing that in mind, I think if you if you can put the probability of your organization very low, then it doesn't really matter um, where the probability comes from. You know, at the end of the day, there's also a probability that all of your servers are going to be struck by lightning at the same time. And so, you know, thinking about finality and as, as, as a binary thing, 
if you were something to take, you know, take something like say uh, the, like the Bitcoin network, you might say, okay, you know, I'll wait 200 block confirmation, and I think that's good enough for uh, for an LLT. Does it mean that sometimes you won't get a very very long reorganization? It could. It, it it's not something that would happen naturally. It would be an attack, and at this point, you know, you would try to figure out what happened. But again, you could have hacks. You could have this type of thing happening in private blockchain, and you would have to sit down and figure out what to do anyway. So it's not a unique problem, I would say, to, uh, to public blockchains. The real question is more. How long does it take for me to be convinced that this thing is not going to be convinced to a reasonable extent that it's not going to revert? So that's for me the biggest question. And you know, waiting uh, a thousand minutes, for example, like a hundred confirmation on Bitcoin is not reasonable, right? That's something that would be uh, that, 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 that could be pretty painful, as opposed to a system where I get the same type of probability, but in a few seconds, for example. So I, I'm trying to think in terms of like how long does it take uh, to have a very very high level of confidence, as opposed to um, like, do you get it or not get it? I, I don't think it's a binary thing. Question over here. Thanks for your talks, guys. Um, very interesting and informative. Um, question on regulation, particularly in financial markets. Um, will there be regulation? How soon and what form might it take in the crypto world? So I'll, I'll let Arthur talk to public blockchains. I mean, the way we view what we do is, um, you know, the regulations as they exist are the things with which we have to conform and, and comply. Now, as a platform provider, um, it's actually the people building the applications and deploying them who have to conform and comply. Uh, but of course, there are things you do in the platform to make it easier for them. It's why it's, we put some of the privacy features in. It's why you know, it, 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 it's, it's back. You know, I, I take off this point about never getting to zero um, risk of, of reorganization, but this finality thing is a big deal. So there's, so there's, so there's things like that. Um, and of course, as we now move, and maybe it says these two worlds converge, you look at the work of the Swiss Digital Exchange, six are doing with tokenized assets on a regulated exchange. You know, there's a whole bunch of questions that, that, and opportunities that will emerge from that. Um, but um, I, guess the, my, I guess my overriding focus is, you know, what is the law into which this will be deployed? And let's make sure we make it easy for people who build the apps to conform to that. Mm. Mm. I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have uh, brought up a very good uh, point there about uh, regulation because uh, you're both blockchains, of course. You're uh, both more infrastructure. Uh, both. I mean, uh, sorry, it's not a blockchain. Distributed ledgers. I, I, I'm unapologetic. I used to, so I'm an engineer, so I used to try and be so precise. And because we, because we, we confirm every transaction one at a time and we don't batch them, um, for ages I say, well, that means we're not a blockchain. But you think, okay, well, technically, but if you look at you know, the transactions, they're chained, they're digitally signed, there's contract verification, there's deterministic execution. Yeah, everything we're doing, apart from batching things into blocks, is, is what a blockchain is. So I just, don't, I just don't distinguish anymore. It's not helpful in every converse, any conversation I have. So I've, I've, just, I've just got over that engineer's hang up about that level of precision. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> so uh, basically, would you consider both of your um, technologies enterprise ready? Well, I've done too much talking, but yes, we just shipped Corda Enterprise 4. People are live with their Corda is enterprise ready. That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Tezos? I would say it depends on your enterprise. I think it's uh, I think it's uh, it's a fairly uh, new technology, uh, you know. And uh, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's like I said, it's uh, like like we've discussed. I think from a technological standpoint uh, and from a, uh, a design standpoint, you're going further with public ledgers. So they're newer than um, basically like using older technology and, uh, and and making them better. It's not. I would say like a lot of private blockchains are uh, much better mousetraps than the mousetrap that existed before. Whereas here, it's a different paradigm so it's a it's a bit new but there's a there's a few businesses that have been successful on public blockchains and so you know uh, to that extent i would say yes hi uh richard sorry at the back cheers um firstly uh, thanks for your talk and um i just want to preface by saying that i've worked in the leverage uh, syndicated loan market for seven years so i understand the importance so i probably completely butchered the description for which i apologize <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I understand the importance of quarter and it and it does something that no one else does at this moment i think yeah. it's actually very important yeah. it allows people to uh, bilaterally trade you know it, it will nullify the use for agency banks and 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 it serves a great purpose at the moment um tezos on the other hand and and other um cryptocurrencies or blockchains they i think are what will allow us to do that in the future without companies such as yourself 
that will be taking no doubt a fee for for the services that you provide. So how do you how do how do how will you protect yourself in the future to the threat of uh, companies or or not companies blockchains sort of coming into the space and offering that level of service that you provide? It's it's a fair question because I guess there's maybe there are two maybe there are two interest I'm interested in Arthur's view on this. There's, I guess there's there's, there's two imp- points hidden I guess under your question, which are one is that the threat from other open source providers. In other words, is is a business model based on um, you know, a commercial distribution of an open source platform? Is that you know what what's what's the long term um, you know, story for that? And then there's a question: what if is 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 the is a business model based on um, sort of like you know, monetizing the value of a token or some sort of crypto? To economic incentive, it, where, where does that go? I'd be fascinated in obviously Arthur's point on the second one. First point, uh, that, that's my job. It's my I'm CTO of R3. It's my job to keep the team innovating, keep working hard, and constantly improve core to the open source platform because people select core. That, that, that's the thing they choose to deploy. And then furthermore, making the commercial distribution highly attractive because people can choose to deploy that on a case by case basis. So that, you know, that's, that, that's, that's just the essence of com- competition that keeps us on our feet. So. Yeah. Yeah. A question here? Yeah. Uh, Richard, coming back to Arthur's um, point about um, whether the um, finality can really be made to be 100.00%, um, clearly the stakeholders want that, um, but is it technically feasible and are you actually achieving it and will you actually achieve it in many, many possible scenarios? Um, and would it be better to say we're doing you're doing your very very best and here you are with you know eight nines or nine nines or something but maybe you can't promise a hundred percent maybe it's good to not oversell that yeah, so as, as an engineer I'm never going to pr- pr- promise hundred percent on anything but but I think there is an important philosophical point which is do you do you regard a essentially a reverse transaction as something that can just happen from time to time and you deal with it and it kind of sucks to be you if it happens to you or do you regard it as a, you know, as, a fa- as a as a failure of the system that if you can't entirely engineer out you at least make sure you treat it as a failure and you have plans in place with you know with um, dispute resolution protocols and you know, in, uh, interlock with the legal system so you planned up front for something that is a fault as opposed to something that you just accept as a cost of doing business because it kind of sucks to be you if you're the one whose transaction gets reversed yeah. Yeah. especially if it's a big one yeah so, yeah sorry guys can we get one more question here because we to got... speak <laughs> for a while <laughs> Well, once it's novated to the clearing house, you do. So. Yeah, no, yeah, it could still be re- it could still be reversed, but uh, but that comes back to the legal interlock. So you read that you you look at the, you look at the you look at the rule book for the exchange and the clearing house, and it tells you what happens in different circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Way I look at what you're doing on Ledger is essentially is like you shouldn't you shouldn't treat what happens on a Ledger as as um, I would say normative. What happens on a ledger is just um, uh, it's just a very very convenient default, and and you know if that default is wrong or or, or gets mistaken, you fix it. And ideally, what you try to engineer is that the fix has to be as rare as possible. Yeah, and these things, uh, if if the things you're uh, outside the pure cryptocurrency situation, the 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 wor- these 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 systems are embedded in the real world, and the embedding happens through the legal systems. So I'm. Um, for- Hello? Oh, yes. We only have time for one more question. I will take this. I'm very sorry. Please do ask your questions uh, when we have pizza because it is going to get cold. But the last question is of the two, if there is a contract or set of transactions that could not be run on one or the other, which do you think it would be that works on your own platform? Wow. So what's the question? Something that you could do on Corda but not Tezos or vice yes. versa? Yes. I don't know. I have to go and think about that. I mean, there's the obvious one, which is, you know, there are no Tezis on Corda. So if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to transact them, they That's would be, one. they'd be issued as depository receipts onto Corda as opposed to living natively on, um, on Tezos. So that's the obvious one. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a reason to interoperate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Tezos is a very generic platform. Oh. So this is a very generic platform. Um, the smart contract language behind it is uh, uh, string complete, essentially. So you can pretty much do whatever uh, whatever you want with a with a platform. So it's very very flexible. In terms of what Corda might not be able to represent, well, you know, Corda does Corda is not going to uh, have a native digital assets and is not going to uh, do consensus uh, for you. 
Uh, I also think, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but so you have basically on this blockchain, you 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 can take the uh, the Bitcoin approach, for example, where um, you have a bunch of uh, assets which are represented as UTXOs, and then you're trying to you know when you when you spend, you're trying to grab those. You show that you have permission to use those assets, and then you move them. But I don't know to which extent uh, Corda is stateful. Uh, and one, one particular of Tezos that's also shared with Ethereum, for example, is that you're not just moving assets around, you're also changing states uh, in the process. And so you have, you know, sure you have assets, but you also have these big uh, stateful contracts on Ethereum or on Tezos, which can represent entire organizations, for example. So um, just on the platform, you create, create uh, uh, an entire organization with its own governance, with its own rules, uh, what people have called DAOs, for example. Um, and so these kind of like more stateful contracts, which uh, use the platform more as a uh, um, as a um, replicated state machine uh, across the network, I think are maybe harder to implement with Corda. That's, that's an interesting observation. Just 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 to clarify, Corda does ship with a whole collection of consensus algorithms you can choose to use. So it's, um, so of course you can plug in other ones as well. But you, and in fact, one of the the features is you can have multiple consensus providers on the same network. So you can say for these types of transactions, we'll use that centralized provider. For these ones, we'll use this Byzantine fault tolerant one. So you can actually have like multiple providers on the same network. Um, I think it's a fair point about stateful contracts. You can implement them on Corda, but you're not forced to. One of the things we tried to do early on was like was it really tease apart how how can you how can you in, how can you maximize privacy um, whilst also being ready for things like zero knowledge proofs on one side or things like Intel SGX on the other? And a key to it was adopting the, um, getting technical, was the UTXO model because it allowed us very carefully and very clearly to be able to identify what data needs to go where without having these sort of like, you know, these, these, like, these big objects that have to be replicated to everybody. You can implement them, but then if you choose to, you're not forced to. Is there any clarification? Maybe one way of, of looking at it would yeah. be like uh, a piece of your ledger that did have a clear owner does every piece of your ledger has a clear owner or not? Yeah. And they are piece on like the Tesla ledger or the Ethereum ledger, which are not really owned by anyone. Thank you very much for those insights. It's very, very interesting. Everyone, please give them a round of applause. Mm -hmm.